Hello, we are going to talk about Jean Paul Sartre in today's lecture. Jean Paul Sartre was born in the year 1905 and died in 1980. So he lived in the most important time of history where he witnessed both the world wars and the 20th century is marked for various developments in the world. He was born in Paris. He was rather born in an aristocratic family, in a bourgeois family. Uh, his father died when he was two years old. His mother married a second time and therefore he was mostly raised in his um, uncle's house. His life was a bundle of bitter experiences. Now these aspects are important when we study an existential, existentialist thinker because their life experiences shape for the most part their philosophy. Therefore he became very unsociable and for the most part he was lonely. So he used to spend a lot of time either in library or in the park or in the cafe. Uh, in his own words, uh, he says, cafe has an immense advantage of indifference because people come and go, nobody bothers about anybody else. Uh, so it has an immense advantage of indifference. Uh, interestingly, he rejected all honors that is um, all honors that are awarded to him, including the Nobel Prize for Literature uh, as a kind of uh, act of uh, rebellion. Because he did not want to be tied down to any institution. Uh, to his credit, he has got many works. Some of them are very important, um, like Nausea, Imagination, Being and Nothingness, Existentialism and Humanism, Critique of Dialectical Reason, and so on. Uh, besides that, uh, the, these writings, he has got many plays, existential plays, they are very, very famous and some of them are made into Hollywood films uh, in the past. I mean, most of them are in black and white, I think. Uh, some of his main ideas are like God is impossible. For him, God just cannot exist. He is impossible. Reality is absurd. Human person is absolutely free. The words he uses, uh, the, uh, the words he uses, um, uh, human person is condemned to be free. Uh, human person makes his own morals and destiny, and the human human person lives in anguish and despair. Hell is other people. Human person is a useless passion. Death is the end of absurd existence. Now, these are some of the important statements that he has made. Uh, we'll discuss some of them. Now, if you notice, these few sentences sum up his entire philosophy. He is very popular among the contemporary philosophers. That is mainly due to the content of his philosophy and his mode of communication. He was a powerful uh, speaker. Uh, he could connect to the masses in a very powerful way. So therefore, um, he, he is um, therefore he is uh, uh, you know very popular, um, especially through his novels and plays. Now let us begin with some of the key ideas of Sartre. What are the most important ideas of Sartre? Is his claim that existence precedes essence. Now Sartre gives an example of a paper knife. A paper knife which is used to open the letters. You know, in the olden time when postal service existed, when you receive an envelope, you have a particular kind of knife, not sharp enough, but it's just to cut open the letters. <coughs> the paper knife would not exist if it did not have a purpose. So the paper knife is made for a particular purpose. Here in this purpose, the purpose of the paper knife is to cut open the letters. In other words, we wouldn't produce a paper knife without knowing what it is for. We produce it only when we know what it is for. If you use it to stab somebody, obviously it is not going to do any good. Yes, if that's not the purpose, you really cannot kill anybody with that. So in this case, if you understand the essence precedes the existence. Now what do we mean by essence? Traditionally, uh, philosophers make a distinction between essence and existence. Essence is the substance of the thing 
which has a particular purpose. Now in this case, the paper knife has a particular purpose and that is what its essence is all about. Without this purpose, it doesn't exist. In case if we didn't have letters and if we didn't uh, have the need to cut open the letters, we wouldn't have a paper knife. So it is the purpose of it, that is the essence of this, that has led to the existence of the paper knife. Now, if you attribute the same thing to the human person, it will imply that the human person has some purpose, just like the paper knives have. So, if the paper knife is made by a genius human who invented it for a particular purpose of uh, you know, cutting open the knife, then that particular person who had invented this paper knife had imagined it, imagined the purpose of the paper knife in his mind. So if you attribute the same thing to human person, then human person should be understood as someone who is made by someone else. Who, the person who made the human person already had in his mind the purpose of the human person. In other words, this is normally the theistic worldview attributed to God. Now, God was having something in mind. He was thinking something. In other words, God wanted someone who can do something. So God created humans. So just as there are things that you should or should not do with paper knives, then it would imply that there are things that we as humans should do or should not do. But for human persons, this idea that there are certain things that we should do and should not do is already predetermined or it is fixed, that goes fundamentally against our ability to choose what we would like to do. So we, in this case, therefore, we cannot accept the idea the essence existed first or the essence came first or before existence. So in the case of human being, because we cannot compromise his or her freedom, his or her ability to choose what he would like to do and by doing, uh, by making the choice what he would like to become, it would imply for human beings that existence precedes essence. We need to first exist and then only we can define ourselves define ourselves in the way we would like to define ourselves and live our lives in the way we make choices and we are the ones who would determine our essence. In other words, it is in and through the existence we create our essence. So the essence is not a pre-given reality. So we are not fixed you know, with some, somebody's imagination what we should do what our purpose is and so on and so forth that would uh, completely annihilate our freedom, our ability to choose, our ability to create ourselves, mold ourselves in a way that we would like to mold ourselves. So therefore, it is in and through our existence that we create our essence. So the implications for the way we should live would mean that we have a God-like responsibility for ourselves. In the sense that we have a God-like responsibility to create what it is to be a human person. Because there is no pre-existing human essence. So the way we create what we would like to be should serve as a model for the entire humanity. So therefore, the responsibility is huge that is uh, on me, which uh, he calls the burden of responsibility. We shall discuss that a little later. But the idea is I am not merely, by choosing certain things, I am not merely choosing for myself, creating myself. By, by doing so, I am also somehow influencing others. So I set examples and pattern my life in such a way that others 
can follow. As you live your life, what you are doing is producing the very idea of what it means to be a human person. Now, Sartre is a declared atheist. So he doesn't believe in God. I mean, he doesn't give any reason. He is not um, trying to give any proofs against the existence of God that he considers as not necessary. He says, so one fine morning I got up and thought there is no God and there is no God. That's it. But he has a reason why the existence of God is not possible within his philosophical framework. Because the existence of God particularly comes from the Western tradition where God is often understood as someone who has created you, who has created the universe. Now that goes fundamentally against his philosophy of freedom. If God has created us, then he will be exactly analogical to the inventor of the paper knife. He had something in mind, a purpose, and accordingly he determined what the paper knife should be. So God would be exactly the same as the inventor of paper knife. Um, if you do an analogy between God and the inventor of paper knife. So that goes fundamentally against our freedom. But Sartre does not deny the possibility of someone to be a theist, someone who can believe in God and existentialist. In other words, one can be a believer in this context, a Christian, yet can accept that existence precedes essence. Now this idea seems puzzling but it makes sense because you can believe that there is a God that made us as a blank state uh, like the empiricist John Locke uh, has said already uh, in the 18th century that we are all tabula rasa. We are, we are made as a blank state with no conception of how and what we should be. In other words, without any predetermined essence. So it is a God that is not so involved with our lives and therefore we are responsible for our lives. So God is in the picture but not playing the role of an artisan. So not, not like the role that the inventor of the paper knife uh, plays. So you can understand God that gave us the greatest degree of freedom and that is still possible. So he doesn't reject that but somehow he is not comfortable with that kind. As I told you he had no reasons uh, given to say why he is an atheist. He simply said well one fine morning I got up and said there is no God and I, I, I think and that makes sense. There is no God. That's it. So this idea of existence precedes essence is very crucial to understand Satrian philosophy. Satri in this context makes a distinction between two important philosophical terms, being in itself and being for itself. Satri outlines the binary distinction that dominates um, his book being and nothingness. The distinction he makes is a distinction between the unconscious being. The unconscious being is the being in itself. Uh, in French it is en soi, et en soi. He makes a distinction between the unconscious being that is being in itself and the conscious being that is being for itself. Being in itself is something that lacks the ability to change. It lacks the ability to change because it is unconscious, because change happens through conscious effort. And it is unaware of itself. Obviously, being in itself has no consciousness. Contrary to that, being for itself is conscious, not conscious of anything. Yes, it is conscious of anything or everything. But more importantly, it is conscious of its own consciousness. It's like, I know that I know. I am aware of the fact that I am aware. So being for itself is not merely conscious, but it is conscious of its own consciousness. But this consciousness is not complete. For Sartre, because it is not complete, 
it is still undefined and because it is undefined there is certain amount of non determination and this non determined nature is what defines human freedom since the being for itself particularly the human person is the being for itself lacks a predetermined essence uh, the being for itself is forced to create itself from nothingness practically there is nothing given uh, as essence so what are you you exist but what are you is not a pre given and therefore you create yourself from nothingness in other words nothingness is the defining characteristic of the being for itself obviously is referring to the human person to give an example a tree is a tree and lacks the ability to change or create its being on the contrary the human person makes himself or herself by his involvement or her involvement in the world by choosing to act in a particular way in the world now he is taking this idea from heidegger obviously he has read heidegger extensively um, when he was a prisoner of war of course there is a lot of um, exchange between heidegger and um, sartre they never met each other but um, heidegger somehow real thought that sartre has totally misunderstood and misinterpreted this idea i am not getting into the details if you want you can always read that Uh, the famous um, essays um, of sartre existentialism is humanism and heidegger's reply to that the letter on humanism i mean that is where you find their disagreements uh, emerging very clearly uh, the human person therefore is an uh, is a being for itself and must actuate his or her own being sartre introduces another idea that the human being for itself the human being that is a being for itself possesses meaning only through his or her perpetual foray into the unknown future in other words the human person is not essentially what one might describe describe him or her as now for example now i am a teacher but it doesn't mean i am a teacher the way a rock is a rock is always a rock so myself as a teacher is never a fixed essence so the way sat uh, you know um, interprets his past and foresees his future is in view of a series of choices the individual human person makes i chose to be a teacher so am i tomorrow i can choose to be something else and i will be Sartre explains this as something inevitable in a conscious being that is the being for itself. Um, why it is inevitable because only the conscious being can recognize what it is not. Through the awareness of what it is not the being for itself becomes what it is. Wholly free in the world with a blank canvas on which the being for itself creates its own being sartre concludes that the being for itself is a being through which nothingness and lack enter the world Now, that's a beautiful idea so you enter into the world as nothingness i mean you have you know we can see there's nothing pre given and therefore there is always a lack so consequently sartre would consider the being for itself Uh, is a lack um sartre argues that we as human beings can become aware of ourselves when we are confronted with the gaze of the other not until we are aware of being watched do we become aware of our own presence so sat brings in idea this idea in terms of the individual beings um, for itself uh, the way they relate to one another so the gaze of the other objectifies me in the sense when one views another person for example building a house 
here she views the person merely as a house builder so there is a sense in which um, you know individuals are objectified from the certain perspective Sartre writes that we perceive ourselves being perceived and come to objectify ourselves in the same way we are being objectified. Now, this is what later many psychologists also would refer to, you know, or even sociologists would, uh, would uh, think of that. Many social scientists would think we begin to accept uh, the way others have defined us. So the gaze of the other robs us of my inherent freedom and causes me to deprive myself of my existence as a being for itself. Instead, learn to falsely identify myself as a being in itself because others can label me, others can define me. So I can just accept it as though this is a predetermined existence. So the moment people call others by names, like uh, uh, positively or negatively, we tend to think these are defined characteristics that I have and these are predetermined essence I have and then I can completely slip into being in itself. Uh, Sartre introduces the idea of uh, existential themes in the context of existence preceding essence. Um, particularly uh, the themes like anguish, abandonment and despair, they are very uh, central and crucial to him against the backdrop of his historical context and the world war he lived through. The awareness that existence precedes essence according to Saad, leads to anguish. Now, what is anguish? Anguish is a feeling that emerges when we, when we recognize that we must choose for everyone, not just for ourselves. But at the same time, we do not have any proof of making the right choice. So I am making a choice, not just for myself, but I am also making a choice for everyone. But I don't know for sure that the choice that I am making is the right one. And this is you know, uh, what causes anguish. Uh, the for everyone is a key to anguish. The pain of anguish comes from the fact that we choose for everyone in this way and yet we do not have the proof that we are choosing the right thing. So Sartre gives the example of a military, a military leader. Now, when a military leader makes a decision, for example, like sending his troops to the battle and literally uh, to face death, the military leader is not choosing what he thinks best for himself. He um, he should take the responsibility uh, and it is inevitable that he would feel the anguish. So because he is making a choice for someone else's life. Sartre says that we never choose for ourselves. We actually choose for everyone. For example, when somebody, this is all, all the more true when it comes to um, ethics. So for example, someone chooses monogamy. So this is the right choice to make. So the person who chooses mono monogamy is not merely choosing for himself or herself, but chooses it for everyone. Because you are the one who are creating what it means to be a human person. So you have a God-like role and therefore that creates the anguish. Sartre also talks uh, in the content of abandonment. He talks about the dilemma of the young human person uh, who has to make a choice between staying home with this mom or to join the French resistance, uh, the French resistance against the Nazis. So it is in this context he tries to explain abandonment by providing this example, this uh, sense of feeling, feeling abandoned. Uh, abandonment would imply for Saad the sense of losing all sure principles given by others. When you make a choice between two, Normally you look for certain principles that can guide you to make the right choice. But you realize, no matter how hard you try, all these principles that are given to you by others, uh, 
they are not very very uh, convincing to you so all these principles somehow seem to be um, not helpful so abandonment abandonment is realizing that these other things can't determine how we actually behave and we really cannot depend on them you have a sense of being lost uh, if you depend on them you are committing to what others are telling you to choose but you are the one who have to make a choice it's like telling if you are if you are if you are a driver and if everybody else is giving you instruction as to how to drive and there's going to be absolute chaos uh, you know if everybody um, does the back seat driving uh, that will be terrible so you can pretend it it is otherwise but you would be deceiving yourself so um well people would say but there are also certain moral standards there are some traditional teachings or religious teachings to which we can turn though we can turn to these teachings it is up to us to judge those moral standards or those religious teachings because we are not passive receivers of any of these things the only consoling thing for sartre is i am not the only one who is lost everyone else is lost all of us are in the same boat so we are not loners there are others in the same boat and to that extent we can depend on others sartre also explains his idea of despair this part comes from the realization that we must depend on others but we are not sure how they would act will they be cooperative or they will not be cooperative we have no idea sat gives the example from the political setting of 1940s he thinks of her, of the resistant uh, resistance members who had to rely on one another when they battled the nazis so you are part of the resistance group or the french resistance army uh, but you need to depend on each other uh, but you don't know whether you can really trust the other person whether the other person would be fully backing you up he also thinks of the idea of um, you know marxist struggles where they have to count on one another whom they would consider as comrades in a modern setting we can feel despair in different kinds of situations you go out and work hard for a political candidate on election day this will only make a difference if other people do the same across the country so you may be a party member for example and you are working hard you are working for the success of a particular candidate or a particular party but you don't know whether others would do as much as you are doing now how is this idea of so you feel despair but how is this idea of despair related to the idea that existence precedes essence we can't be sure how others will act because there is no inbuilt um, you know human essence if there is an inbuilt human essence then we can know how others would act we don't know i mean this is uh, something that is you know intrinsic we can never understand others uh, let alone uh, we can never understand ourselves in the first place so we remain always a mystery and on the top of it to understand others their motives whether they are re- really with you or they are not really with you or they are pretending to be with you you have no idea about any of these things because there is nothing like something you know where fixed essence is there in them we cannot be sure of unlike uh, the being in itself for example you know if a tree or if a seed in a particular environment in a particular uh, maneuver and so on will grow in a grow in a particular way i mean that's very very easy it is predictable human persons are not predictable because there is no inbuilt essence because they keep creating their own essence they keep uh, making themselves constantly uh, there is no question of predictability that is um, you know however um, you know according to sad there is a lot of unpredictability so though some critics would say there is much more human predictability than sad who was willing to admit well this is a matter of debate but to some extent definitely sad is right we can at least say convincingly there is to some extent there is certain sense of unpredictability in the humans um it is true that in situations requiring cooperation we have to take all the risk 
because we don't know we know we don't know for sure whether we get the same cooperation from others so that is why you know assuming leadership is always difficult because you never know whether everybody is on the same page so um, this is also true in everyday experience of ours like for example you know uh, driving can be very uh, you know rewarding experience if we know for sure everybody will follow the traffic rules everybody will stop at the red light and everybody will move only at the green light but do you think that is the that is the experience that we have no It creates too much of disparity because we may be following all the rules uh, but the other absolutely would um, would not follow anything you know when i came back from um, from abroad i was very particular when i was driving on the streets of pune i follow every signal afterwards i realized it looks like uh, i am i am kind of completely um, you know out of the whole um, synchronization because everybody uh, wiggles through his way and uh, i was you know trying to be completely people would get annoyed with the way you would drive because you are not just going going in the flow so you want to not to go in the flow um yeah there's a lot of unpredictability there how are this would um, respond in a situation um so this is what leads to despair i mean these are many of these uh, existential themes that sartre uh, discusses uh, in detail i'm going to stop now so we'll open up for some discussion then i'll come back with the lecture one of the important uh, themes that sartre discusses in his writing is the idea of freedom so in the early uh, phase of his career sath focused mainly on his belief in the sanctity of every individual consciousness in other words a consciousness that results from every person's subjective and individual experience of the world uh, he was particularly attuned to the ways that people are objectified by the gaze of others but gradually as sartre became more involved in the concrete political questions of his time he began to focus more on the larger social structures that systematically objectify people and failed to recognize the individual consciousness and the individual innate freedom now for sartre these structures include capitalist exploitation colonialism racism and sexism so sartre was initially looking at the individual gaze that objectified you but later he realized that could be a systemic gaze the structures could also objectify you. and some of these uh, structures for him uh, these are very relevant even today ca- capitalist exploitation colonialism racism and sexism and in fact um, sartre is very appalled by the way how these some of these practices still existed in his time and of course if he he was um, appalled and we have all the more reasons to be appalled even um, you know decades after his um, after his death we still have this problem uh, sartre's focus on individual freedom was primarily uh, shaped uh, i mean that uh, primarily shaped his views on marxism Uh, politically speaking sartre was uh, closely associated to the french communist party for many years but he never joined the party uh, primarily because of his uh, suspicion of the authoritarian states and institutions of all kinds especially after the soviet invasion of hungary in 1956 um he wanted uh, sartre wanted the working class to collectively overthrow the capitalist system and believed that any political struggle should affirm and allow for the individual freedom of all human beings so while in principle he was adhering to the marxist idea of uh, of overthrowing the uh, capitalist um, you know economy um, or or uh, the you know the hegemony he was very skeptical about the way it is done in many of these uh, communist countries because that robbed people of their freedom so in accordance uh, with this view sartre um, did not accept um, marx's view that economic and social rea- realities define consciousness now why is that because uh, for sartre is a champion of freedom 
but mars claim essential claim is our consciousness consciousness is determined by the material conditions of history so basically the economics this goes against the fundamental assertion of sartre that we are free beings so sartre thought we are always free beings no matter how objectified we may be the gifts of freedom and consciousness mean that we always have the possibility of making something out of the circumstance of objectification even if there is a structural objectification including capitalist capitalist exploitation or sexism or racism uh, this is not going to define me i am going to resist i am going to make my choice even within this objectification that happens so in sarts view individual freedom of consciousness is a human personality's gift but at the same time it is also the human person's curse it is a curse because it comes with the responsibility to shape our own lives and this responsibility is not a easy one because it comes with the hurdle so i have a freedom to choose yes but there's a lot of hurdles and obstacles that i face uh, you know because of this objectification not merely by the gaze of uh, another individual but there is also a, a systemic way in which i am objectified so it becomes a curse my freedom becomes my curse because it brings with it you know, a god like responsibility for me to to struggle with these obstacles and to create and shape my life it is in this context he would also call the responsibility as burdensome while sartre believed in the essential freedom of individuals he also believed that as free beings we are responsible for all the elements for our consciousness and for our actions in other words with total freedom comes total responsibility i cannot find fault with someone for the situation i am in he believed that even those people who wish not to be responsible who declare themselves not responsible for themselves or their actions are still making a conscious choice they are making a conscious choice not to assume responsibility to that extent they are responsible uh, you know for anything that happens including the consequence of their inaction so sartre's moral philosophy maintains that ethics is essentially a matter of individual conscience so it is not that you follow certain set of rules that are some moral codes that make you ethical person you become an ethical person by making certain choices for yourself which has certain consequences and assuming responsibility for those consequences sartre reveals much about his own choice in the writings about oppressive social structures and the ways in which individuals might ideally interact with each other to affirm their respective human personalities at the same time he is dismissive of any version of universal ethics just like what utilitarians or the deontology of kant would give us he is therefore clear in his belief that morals are first and foremost a matter of subjective individual conscience it is in this context of discussing his i understanding of freedom and therefore responsibility uh, he develops his moral philosophy and he also introduces the idea of bad faith uh, now bad faith is a very technical meaning it's a translation from uh, french um, now what does this bad faith mean for sartre essentially it means uh, deception now what is this deception it is not any uh, old deception um you know in uh, in the context of sartre uh, distinctive theory of self consciousness it is a reflexive form of deception that arises from unfolding the paradox of lying to oneself in other words it is a self deception you lie to yourself the consciousness of our radical freedom according to sartre as we have seen is anguish which we typically blot out by immersing ourselves in action but in the moments of reflexive self awareness we are faced with a choice to face up to our freedom or to flee from it 
if we flee from our freedom then we are in bad faith according to sartre sartre begins his analysis of bad faith by comparing it to lying troll bad faith in walls lying to oneself by denying one's freedom freedom pretending that one had no choice in the matter um adapting oneself to preordained roles and conventions as if they were the only possible human reality but sartre notes that the essence of the lie implies in fact that the liar is in complete possession of the truth while he is hiding it consequently a lie told to oneself is bound to be a performative failure in the sense that can that one can never truly be taken in by it it therefore has to be supplemented by a second lie whereby we deceive ourselves by pretending that we are deceived so it's a lie after lie the paradoxical structure of lying to oneself for sath imparts a certain brittle quality to bad faith in the words of sath i quote him we have here and evanescent phenomena which exists only in and through its own differentiation an evanescent phenomenon which exists only in and through its own differentiation if it endures it does so only by constantly renewing itself so bad faith uh, you know is lived in a particular style of life and sartre identifies bad faith with the hypocrisies of the bourgeois convention convention uh, bad faith is uh, you know it has a meta stable nature because it imparts a certain symmetry of the choice mentioned between face uh, that is between facing up to our freedom or fleeing from our freedom now this is one of the important themes that sartre uh, keeps affirming he keeps returning to this idea time and again particularly uh, in 1945 uh, in his famous lecture titled existentialism and humanism uh, he notes in clear words choice is possible but what is not possible is not to choose i can always choose but i must know that if i do not choose that is still a choice in other words i choose not to choose that is still a choice in this sense bad faith represents a futile attempt to choose not to have a choice so for him if you are an authentic human being then you must be making choices you must be able to make ethical decisions uh, that is voluntary you make out of your freedom but it is in a way compelling because you cannot but choose in that sense it is compelling so in that sense you know freedom is something that is for sath is um, is not an optional you know it, it is freedom is something that is compelling freedom exists it is not that if i want i can be free you are free only you can deny it at best so then of course you are in bad faith now one of the important um, ideas of sartre which is often misunderstood and understood is this idea hell is the other people now it is very important to understand this particular idea of sartre often time people have criticized him thoroughly as almost he is a satanist Uh, he has no regard for other people being an existentialist he is promoting a certain amount of selfishness because other people uh, are helped to you uh, that's a very bad reading of sartre so you must understand sartre in the context of his writing this particular line hell is other people is mentioned not in any of his uh, philosophical writings but in one of his famous plays called no exit it's a beautiful play uh, if anybody is interested you can just read that i'm sure you will get some online copy uh, in french it is called cui clos uh, cui clos literally means um, you know shut door okay now in, in english it is translated as uh, no exit but the word cui clos 
the shut door has also a legal connotation because in the French legal system, uh, hearings were held in private. Okay, uh, so it is in the shut door. So basically, therefore, uiclo is a legal term which is appropriate for the play uh, because what happens in the legal system is to uh, is to judge people for what they have done. So this is an appropriate title because this play deals with three main characters who are in hell, who find themselves in hell. Um, well, hell is a kind of very western idea, it's a Christian idea. I don't see any... In India, we really don't have an idea of hell, do we? I mean, the Indian traditions we don't have. But this is a typical Christian idea of hell is a place of eternal damnation, okay? Where after your death, if you have not lived the right life and so on, you are condemned uh, to, to have an eternal damnation. You spend eternity in a room and you will never be able to leave. So that is the idea of hell. So they find themselves in hell. So this line, hell is other people, um, okay, um, is, is a context in which that, you know, one of the characters in the place says this particular thing, hell is other people. Uh, we need to understand this in the context of this play. Um, the play is about uh, three characters. Uh, now the three characters involve one Mr. Garson or sometimes also his name is given as Krado. Some translations give it as Garson. Now who is Garson? Uh, G-A-R-C-A-N. He has tortured his wife, not just physically but also emotionally. Not only has he tortured his wife in his lifetime emotionally, but he also enjoyed it. And he had no remorse whatsoever for this kind of behavior. The second character is Enos. Enos was a gay, a lesbian. The problem is not that she was a lesbian. You know, Satru was the champion of all these things. But the problem was that she broke up a marriage. A marriage so that she can gain access to the wife of uh, wife in that marriage. Estelle is a third character. She has murdered her baby because she thought, you know, that would um, make her life, uh, you know, difficult for her to have a free uh, life. And therefore she killed her baby, murdered her baby. baby. That also caused the suicide of her boyfriend, uh, the baby of the boyfriend, therefore he also committed suicide. Now, Satra makes it clear, the actions are not the reasons why these characters of the play find themselves in hell. Garse or Krado always does anything he can to preserve his own self-interest. Now, Satra sees an attitude of Nazi in this approach. I mean, literally, Grado, the character of Grado or Garza is um, his idea of the, I mean, is symbolic of the Nazi, a Nazi tendency, you know, do anything to preserve your own self-interest. Estelle, she is not only interested in others, um, uh, no, Estelle is interested only in others to the extent they pay attention to her. Enos sees other people as targets for her manipulation. These characters are in hell because they are trivial and pretentious people. This is precisely Sars' satiric point. They are in hell because they are petty bourgeois. Their concern for the world goes only as far as the extent to which the world services uh, their needs. So others should serve them, not, not they should serve the world. When it doesn't adequately cater to their needs, this is the most important point. They blame the world and the people in it. If when I am not getting what I need, what others, uh, and the service of others, if I don't get, instead of blaming myself that I am too much of a person with self-interest and not contributing to the others, I try to begin to blame others. They are the ones who don't assume 
responsibility for their lives they think their life is miserable because others have done this they have done this so essentially you deny your own freedom by not assuming responsibility and these people are in bad faith for such people hell is other people so hell is other people is not for someone who assumes his or her freedom and acts in response acts with responsibility in good faith not at all only for those people who flee from freedom who are in bad faith for such people others are hell hell is other people but they don't realize they are in hell because they have made decisions that has led to the situation not others so they they don't want to assume that they don't want to accept it they don't want to recognize it so in other words in blaming other people the characters in the play as at points out are pointing fingers in the wrong direction why should the world be responsible for any of the choices of actions that i make why should i blame others for what i choose to do so ultimately the play no exit does not say that hell is other people it only says you know um, the it evokes the idea of um, milton's paradise lost where the satan um, you know says which way i fly is hell myself am hell so you can make your life a hell or heaven that the choice is up to you but when you don't do that you find other is hell so you know so the, the famous uh, statement of the satan in the milton's lost paradise which will way i fly is hell myself am hell we construct a hell for ourselves so sad says when you refuse to take the responsibility for our own actions leaving us at the mercy of the options of other obviously hell is other people so hell is the other people is the expression of the damned souls i mean that is a metaphorical language who will remain in the hell they have created until they learn to own up their own behaviors or until they begin to choose to help each other to put someone else ahead of their own so hell is other people is exactly what sartre is not saying he is he is saying people who say hell is other people they are missing the point that's a, that's the whole approach of this but often times it is confused with this idea it is in fact one of the character which says um, in the play so the characters have built hell with their own hands they are the ones who will have to take it apart again others cannot do much about it so if i create a hell for myself i have to learn to break it down so i cannot uh, you know blame others for it so it's a very beautiful idea in that sense so again it's a matter of affirming one's responsibility um you know there is a famous um, uh, netflix series i'm sure most of you must have seen that the good place that is based on uh, this idea of sat so by reversing it of course so instead of saying hell is you see there are four um, characters there um i don't know if you have seen that uh, you think about it it's quite interesting in that sense in fact one of the students last year wrote a seminar paper with me on this particular idea of um, sartre existentialist thinking um and the and the um, complementary part of the good place good so if you are responsible if you are free then you you, you assume responsibility for it but you don't only assume responsibility for yourself but for others and that responsibility should be translated to your commitment to the society so the french word is engagement the english translators give the same word for commitment so engagement you engage yourself in the social life so you don't uh, keep yourself away away from social life that explains why sartre was very committed to social life and he was typically a philosopher of the streets so he could go down the street and uh, you know 
he was all the time on the street uh, you know when he had to raise his voice against the government I and mean, he has been arrested many times so he criticized the government policies numerous times particularly with the algerian war when the french went uh, for algerian war uh, he was very vocal about it and he was uh, making protest after protest in the streets of paris and so on uh, so that commitment commitment to society uh, the engagement so this i sort of idea of engagement is both ethical and political they are ethical and political virtues and it begins with the premise that humans are necessarily situated in particular places and time so therefore for sartre it is impossible to be politically neutral and there is no such thing as political neutrality i mean that would be a you know that would be again it would be a deception you are lying to yourself the only honest course is to openly admit and defend one's political commitments So engagement is a political version of the existential authenticity which requires affirming one's freedom within a social context. So you cannot go on blaming others but you have to assume response your freedom with responsibility in your social context. Authenticity is a wider notion than engagement surely yes because authenticity requires awareness and responsibility with respect to the totality of one's being. and overcoming bad faith globally existential engagement on the other hand requires political awareness it's not just awareness about the totality of your being but the political awareness and responsibility and overcoming bad faith with respect to political issues therefore you cannot be a political you have to be political no matter what what your commitments are Sartrean engagement can be usefully compared to common conceptions of moral responsibility. Sartre accepts the notion that a person should be held morally responsible for an action that he or she intentionally causes. The distinguishing mark of Sartre's view is his broad extension of the notion of causal responsibility. Sartre holds an extremely demanding view of the negative responsibility meaning to say responsibility for omissions my responsibility which i don't do so if i i, I should speak against certain things but i choose not to that is a responsibility for omission uh, this kind of passivity is equivalent to activity because of the consequences it makes any omitted action is an action for which an agent is culpable when i could stop uh, you know the government from advancing from uh, from certain uh, policies that is detrimental to some people i should speak if i don't then obviously what i am doing is i am uh, what i am doing uh, for what i am doing i am culpable in a variety of works sath uses the case of war to illustrate this view you find the citizen of a nation at war then the war is mine and i bear a direct personal responsibility for the action of my government and that is the reason sartre went on the, for the protest when for the french um, went for war with uh, with algeria the algerian war so his famous statement in one of his essays is we are all assassins this epitomizes his view in other words the average citizen is equally culpable for the government especially the government's action of enforcing a certain dangerous policy which would include many thing including war death penalty and so on and so forth now let us sum up sarts idea we will conclude this uh, in late works like uh, his critique uh, sart combines a demanding account of personal responsibility with a functionalist view that individuals incarnate their environment the result is a portrait of social responsibility that holds average citizens responsible for diffuse social ills like racism poverty colonialism and sexism you and i cannot say that i am not responsible for that you and i may not be doing it but we are all equally responsible because we have failed not we have failed um, uh, the people by not speaking despite the fact that sath fell short of offering a detailed analysis of negative responsibility which would indicate is sometimes exaggerated 
ascription of individual moral liability for collective harms his political responsibility remains one of the most powerful you know tools of the 20th century thank you very much